This is a CNA podcast. Picture this. You are heading to work, leaving behind blue skies and fresh air to descend into absolute darkness below. The mine is where you grind to make a living, the only light coming from a small fixture on your helmet. The beam barely penetrates the black around you. A sprinkling of coal dust covers your mask and exposed skin. And at times, all you hear is this. Hello and welcome to CNA Correspondent. I'm your host, Teresa Tang. This is the podcast where our network of correspondents shine a light on the stories from wherever they are in the world, bringing you behind and beyond the headlines. On today's edition, we explore South Korea's energy dilemma. South Korea is poor in natural resources and imports an astounding 94% of its energy sources. And that has posed a challenge, figuring out what the best energy mix is to zero out emissions. From the bowels of a coal mine to a nuclear power plant, our Korea correspondent Lim Yun Suk looks at why the country's clean energy push is pushing some people to despair. She joins me now. Welcome, Yun Suk. Thank you. All right, Yun Suk, first off, let's talk about the political tug of war between the country's current and former presidents. They don't seem to be on the same page when it comes to the role of nuclear power and coal. Well, yes, you know, South Korean presidents, former and current, are all aware that this country needs some kind of an energy mix to meet its electricity demand. But how much of what is needed is the big question. And that changes whenever we have a new president here in South Korea which many experts here are saying that that alone is a big problem because they're saying that when it comes to the energy issue, it should be a long-term solution, a long-term policy of the South Korean government and not something that changes every five years since the president here can only serve a single five-year term. Now, the energy mix usually includes the nuclear power, the coal power and renewable energies like hydrogen. How much focus do you put in each of those sectors differs from the different leaders. Like, for example, President Yoon song yeol he says he understands that renewable energy is the way to go, but that's just going to take a lot of time. And so he wants to actively operate the nuclear power plants across the country. He says nuclear power plant is the thing right now around the world, and he wants to increase that proportion to 30% from the current 25 to 27% which his predecessor, Moon Jae-in, had tried to phase out nuclear plants during his five-year term. So these nuclear power plants were halted under the Moon administration, but now they're reopening up again because of this change in policy. And you actually stepped foot in one of the nuclear power plants, one of 24 across the country. What was that experience like? Did you have to wear any protective gear, for instance? I admit, when I'm even close to an X-ray machine, I get a bit uneasy. Well, I didn't go inside a nuclear plant this time because for security reasons, but I did go to this huge compound where there are several nuclear plants inside that compound. And there's just one section inside that compound where there are plans to build new ones. So I went there to have a look. And right now it's really just bare land. And it's in the initial stage of getting the permits, the environmental permits to be able to go and start the process of reactivating this because all of that came to a halt in 2017. Recently, President Yoon song yeol visited the same site and there he emphasized the importance of nuclear power plants in the country. And so we're expecting this whole process of getting the permits and all of that to be really quick. But it was very interesting to see some of the nuclear power reactors actually there in front of my eyes. So if nuclear power is going to be part of Korea's energy future, one issue that needs to be addressed is where are you going to put all of that nuclear waste? Where are the hot and highly radioactive spent uranium fuel rods going to go? Are there plans for a waste facility? That is the big question for the South Korean government now. And I think they will have to find an answer very soon because South Korea has been running the nuclear power reactors for decades, and this is a very densely population. And right now, there are about 25 of the nuclear power plants across the country. 
But there's so many one nuclear waste facility, and that's in Gyeongju, which I don't know if you've heard of it, but many tourists would have because it is a tourist attraction there in the North Gyeongsang province. Now, I did go to that one waste facility, and there I did have to wear gowns and gloves and helmet before I was allowed to go in. Because this is an underground radioactive nuclear waste disposal facility, and it only opened up in 2015. And since then, it has been receiving waste from nuclear power plants, but also other places like different industries, factories, and hospitals. That's because only the low and intermediate level waste are disposed there. Things like the gowns, the gloves, things that you will find in the x-ray departments at the hospitals. Now, the big problem is that there is no permanent waste disposable site for the high level radioactive waste, the spent nuclear fuels. Currently, they're being disposed at temporary storage facilities at the 25 nuclear power plants, but they're filling out real fast. And so they need to be taken somewhere. There's some discussions that perhaps they can be stored overseas, but then also here in South Korea, the South Korean government is looking to see where they can have this facility located because the South Korean government, once it does announce where the location will be, you're definitely going to see a lot of South Koreans out there in the streets demonstrating because they don't want a nuclear waste facility in their backyard. Apparently right now, Finland is the only country in the world that has that permanent nuclear waste facility, and it took Finland about 40 years. Many experts are saying it could take much longer for South Korea. Wow, 40 years. And like you said, people agree that this waste needs to be disposed of safely, but just nowhere near them, right? All right, stay with us. Up next on CNA Correspondent, we hear from miners, and we talk about the economic cost of leaving the black gold behind. Hi, I'm Stephen Chia, and I host the new season of our podcast, Heart of the Matter. Join me in getting right to the heart of the headlines as we speak with experts and newsmakers to delve deep into the most talked about news developments. Look out for our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. We're back with Lim Yun Suk, CNA's Korea correspondent. Yun Suk, this job has taken you to so many interesting locations, and a coal mine has really got to be one of the most memorable. Definitely. I think it's an experience I will never forget. It's somewhere where I did have to go and take all my clothes off and instead wear the clothes that they gave me. I was also given gloves, a very important helmet, because There's only one light, and that's on this helmet that I was told to wear. And this is an underground tunnel, which is pitch black. You cannot see anything in front of you, around you, or anything in that underground tunnel. And so that helmet is very important. But, you know, from the entrance of this tunnel, we had to walk about 10, 15 minutes in the dark with that one light. Oh, wow. And where there was an elevator there, that was going to take us down about 800 meters underground. And once we went down, it did take a few minutes to go 800 meters underground. But once we got off the elevator, we also had to go on this. It was like a cart, but that cart was going to take us deeper down into the mine. And after that ride, we still had to go down further down the steep stairs. And remember, the only light I had to guide me was on my helmet. And I had no idea what was around me. I had to go down those steep stairs. And they were very near to, there was nobody there able to hold my hand or I had one rail that I could hold on to, but that was it. And only one person was allowed to go down one by one. And then suddenly I heard the sound. Yun Suk, what were those miners saying? I could make out some Korean there, but I don't understand what they were saying. And what was it like for you and your cameraman to witness these men at work? They were saying, blast, blast. So they were giving out a warning to the people there, including myself and the crew. And there was an explosion that went off inside that underground tunnel while I was there and everybody else were there with me. And that explosion, the miners were saying, goes off like 
30, 40 times a day. And while I was there, it was going off like two, three times that they did warn me to ensure that my ears were blocked while they were standing there as if it was a routine thing for these miners. But the reason that they do this is because they need to break up this coal from the walls so that they can extract the coal from there. And they need the help of the explosions. And these coal that they mined are usually used by people in the low income bracket who rely on this coal during the winter. And also, you know, all those Korean barbecues that you see, I'm sure you've seen those coal briquettes that they use. Well, that's where it comes from. It comes from this mine across South Korea. And so, you know, despite the fact that the South Korean economy is one of the top 10 in the world, they still have to rely on these underground mines to get their fuel and also at the restaurants. So if these mines shut down, if South Korea moves away from coal use, that means a huge impact on these miners. You talk to them. Are they resigned to the notion that their communities could potentially collapse? Or are they hopeful that they'll still have a place in a hydrogen-based economy? Well, right now, talking to the miners, and many of them have been there for about 20, 30 years, some even 40 years, um, it's mixed. This whole town of Tebek, where this mine is located, it used to be called the Coal Miners City. It was very famous here in South Korea for that because everyone there lived off those mines. But the number of coal mines have drastically been reduced. And in fact, the mine that we visited is also scheduled to close down in 2024. Now, the miners say that they know the mines have to close. In fact, many say they're happy in a way that they don't have to go back to the mines to work. But at the same time, they don't know what else to do except to mine because that's what they've been doing all their life. And so there are those concerns. And also talking to people outside the coal mines who run restaurants and businesses, they too are worried that they will have no business once the coal mine closes down. The Tebek city is worried, saying that the local economy can collapse. And so it is still looking, despite the fact that for decades, the South Korean government has said that the coal mines will have to close down eventually. They're trying to see if there's another way around this. The miners, too, some say they're looking for new jobs. But many of them also told me half seriously, but also half jokingly, that the first thing they will likely have to do is to admit themselves to the hospitals for treatment. And this one miner tells me why. The space is very tight inside the mine. We need to weave through that small space carrying heavy loads. When we move around, we bump our heads, we get neck problems, we get cuts, and even break our bones. If you go in for yourself, you can see how different it is. It's heaven and hell. At least you get fresh air outside. Were they depressed? Like when you visited that community? No, they were all smiling and they were really nice. Yeah, I mean, it's a job that they've had. But I think I can say is, although I was there for just half an hour, to me, thinking of having to go back to that coal mine the next day, I don't think I would be able to bear it. Because you go in and although I was there for half a day, my throat was hurting so much, although I had a mask on. And so I can imagine what it must be like for them. And for many of them, though, they do say that they're happy. I think this has been their home all their lives. And for me, during that half day there, I even had a meal with them inside because they do go to work early. and They're there for about seven, eight hours. So to them, while they're there inside this underground tunnel, it's their home. Yun Sook, thank you to you and to your crew for going to such lengths for bringing us this story. And no doubt, those miners appreciate you bringing their story to light as well. The TV version of CNA Correspondent airs on CNA every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. You can also catch up with them whenever you like on CNA.Asia. Follow this podcast version that takes you behind the scenes with our correspondents so you'll know when a new episode is out. Our podcast team is made up of Daniel Lee, Crispina Robert, Clara Ong, and me, Teresa Tang. Thank you for listening. Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. 
It's your family. It's your choice. First choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more.